Thank you for downloading or watching our sermon series titled Redeemed in Christ. We are going through the Heidelberg Catechism. The Catechism is written in 1563 using a question and answer format. The Catechism's goal is to instruct the Lord's people to understand the Reformed faith by answering common questions from the Scripture. Please join us as we walk through this historic document and ponder the Lord's grace and mercy as we are reminded that we are redeemed in Christ. The Heidelberg Catechism has been very plain and very clear that the law of God is a lot deeper than merely a few uh, outward things that we may desire to do or may think that it is. Uh, Once again, we're reminded that we're easily and tempted to redefine the law of God to make it easier uh, than what it really is, so we feel pretty good about ourselves. But now we move on to the issue of stealing, and stealing is one of those things where we can think, you know, I haven't literally held someone at gunpoint, I haven't robbed them, I haven't burglarized a home, I haven't shoplifted, therefore I'm doing a pretty good job in terms of the Christian life. But the Catechism is telling us that there's a lot more going on in terms of stealing. Uh, Something we've noticed in the Catechism is that lays out a negative side of the law of God and a positive side. Remember, the negative is what we are not to be doing. Uh, The positive is what we ought to be doing, uh, how we ought to live this out. So when we talk about stealing, uh, we can always put it in the negative of do not steal, right? We can think we're not supposed to steal, We understand that. We don't always think in terms of stealing as being something positive, something we are to do uh, that ultimately contributes uh, to the well-being of our neighbor. And so in terms of this, uh, what what do we find in terms of the positive side of stealing as to how we do this in a positive manner other than do not steal? Well, as we consider this, we'll simply see what is forbidden and what is commanded. So in terms of what is forbidden, well, there's obviously the explicit theft that we are not to do. Uh, So we have robbery, where normally we think of taking something by force or threat. Uh, There's also just general theft. Uh, This is relieving someone of a material item that um, we are taking for free that they did not give to us. So clearly, the obvious thing is we're not to do this. This is forbidden. But going on, the Catechism talks about evil tricks and schemes. Uh, This is basically trying to figure out how to get something from someone else uh, through dishonest means, maybe massaging the truth a little bit, uh, just to make sure that we get what we want. Taking by force. So again, this is falling under robbery, where we take something by force, desiring something. Uh, So we, we force a person to give it up to us. But the Catechism cuts even deeper, where it says inaccurate measurements, size, and volume. Uh, So this would be along the lines, if we could think of a gas station, if you look at the pump, there's usually some uh, sticker that says this pump was certified on this date. What that simply means is that they really certify that a gallon is a gallon. Uh, That way, they're not selling 0.95 gallons when you think you're buying a gallon each time. We might say, well, what's the big deal? But over a day or a week, uh, that can be quite profitable and illegal. And so that's what the catechism is saying. We're we're not to try to be doing those things. Fraudulent merchandising. Now, if you've ever been to a city and you have someone offer to sell you a watch and they guarantee it's a Rolex watch and it's $30, uh, you pretty much figure out it's not a real Rolex watch. Uh, So the reality is that's fraudulent merchandising. So it's Slapping a name on something to make it seem something more than what it really is. Uh, In our society, we talk about brand protection, uh, something that sometimes can sound annoying from time to time, but this is the purpose of it. So you know what you're actually buying is the actual product uh, that they're selling. Counterfeit money. This could be purposely writing uh, fraudulent checks, Uh, producing money that looks legitimate but's not legitimate, Uh, excessive interest. Uh, This would be along the lines of loan sharking or taking advantage of someone uh, who's in a bit of a desperate situation. So the catechism's not saying 
Uh, we, we can't act as a bank and maybe charge some interest, but the catechism's reminding us that, that when we look at this, we need to be very careful in, in how we conduct ourselves in terms of business and, and think about the, the bigger picture of being in Christ. And then it goes on to say anything that is forbidden by God. So now it's, it's general. So it's the invitation for us to truly understand what does God permit, what is God forbidding, these are the things we ought to avoid. But then we go on that there's two other things that he lists. It's sort of positive and negative here. Uh, we're not to be greedy. So obviously greed is wrong. Uh, we're not to basically be given over to a, a consistent desire for more and more, uh, having sort of that covetous heart. So that's a reminder here that uh, we can have that tendency to always want more and never have enough or never be satisfied. The other side where it says not squander his gifts, a way of putting this positively, would be being a good steward of the things that he entrusts to us. And that's what the catechism wants us to understand. When we truly have a per perspective of God's providence and his care for us, uh, we understand that what God gives to us and entrusts to us, it's not just ours. You know, we're, we're managers of his estate and who he is. And so this is where I wanted to go to the parable that we read about here in Luke 16. It's uh, cited in, in one of the proof texts of our catechism. And I thought it's, it's sort of an interesting parable. Uh, because on the one hand, uh, Christ almost seems to speak very well of this dishonest manager for his, his shrewdness and how he conducts himself, almost as if this contradicts what the catechism is teaching us. And it's actually good to be uh, dishonest and shrewd in certain instances, if you read this superficially. And so how, how do we get there? Well, notice the scenario that Christ lays out in this parable. And the scenario is that there's a rich man and he has a manager. So this man, when, when you hear the deficit, is a very um, well-off businessman, probably a very successful businessman. Uh, when you have these people who owe him money uh, and a decent sum of money, and also a businessman who is so successful that he doesn't even notice that people are cheating him. And so he has uh, so much wealth coming in that, that he doesn't really notice <clears throat> that the manager is rather incompetent as Christ lays it out. Or at least we, we might sort of read that in the best light that maybe this guy's a little in over his head. When you look at what the Lord tells us in, in terms of this, it, it's not just that the manager's incompetent. It says the manager's squandering his wealth. Now, this, this squandering and scattering is, is what we find in Luke's gospel. For instance, Luke 1, verse 51, uh, we have the celebration of the Lord exalting the weak, and he scatters those who are his enemies. Now, the scattering is, is an absolute leveling and devastation. It's, it's basically taking like a, a glass a pane and, and smashing it into small little pieces uh, that you're not going to glue it back together easily. So it's, it's just an absolute squandering, scattering of things. Now the same wording, if you notice when I read the parable of the prodigal son, in Luke 15, 13, we have the, the younger brother who squanders, scatters this, this, um, this wealth, his father's inheritance, uh, in a rather uh, just wasteful way. There, there's not any thought other than the moment of, this is what I desire, uh, it's sinful, I don't care if it's sinful, I'm just going to do this and squander the money on this. So it's, it's not any thought, it's nothing deliberate. It's just a, a squandering of, of money, just, just sending it away, just spending it carelessly without any thought of its consequence. So that's what the manager's doing. So, so we might want to say, well, maybe the guy's just incompetent. No, Christ tells us this isn't an issue of competence. This is an issue of a guy who's just squandering. He's just spending money uh, without any care or any thought of his master. He's just doing what he wants with it. So the report comes to the master. And this man's in a bit of a quandary. So on the one hand, when he says, I'm too weak to dig, it means basically I'm, I'm too weak to do manual labor. Uh, so he understands he, he's not 
going to get a job in the field. He's not going to be able to work with his hands. He, he doesn't have that ability. So he's thinking, I, I had a pretty sweet gig here. here I was managing my, my master's wealth. Now I'm going to be sent off. Goodness, I, I, can't, I can't do manual labor. So the other option is, well, I, I, I could beg, but, but I'm too proud to beg. Because a man's at least competent enough to know he's not going to go to another manager and say, hey, can I manage your wealth? And the guy's going to say, yeah, exactly. That's what I want you to do, you know. Uh, you're going to take my two million and make it into one million. That's exactly what I want you to do. That's great. Uh, so, of course, he knows no other manager is going to do that. And so he knows these are really realistically his only two options. But this man is shrewd. And so we, we understand that on the one hand, we might say, well, maybe he's an incompetent manager, but, but he's actually pretty shrewd, pretty smart. And he comes up with a scheme. And in terms of his scheme, he's not fired immediately. So we know in our society, sometimes when people get terminated or fired, that, that it's immediate. Uh, sometimes you escort them off the premises, and this is sort of an example as to why. So the man realizes, I, I still have authority. I, I'm not out on my own, the master hasn't fired me, but I know it's coming. So he gathers those who owes the master money, and he takes these individuals, and basically, as we read in the text, that he tells them to, to slash what they owe. And we learn his motivation behind this. His motivation is, well, I can't beg, I can't do manual labor, but you know what? Maybe one of these individuals will have compassion on me take me into their house, and, and somehow I'll be okay. And so notice that immediately his fundamental concern is resolved. And what's his fundamental concern as Christ lays it out in his parable? It's important to understand that. The fundamental concern is how am I going to get through today or tomorrow or live under the sun? So his concern is only for this world. That, that's it. There's no perspective bigger than his master, no perspective bigger than uh, his immediate scenario, other than I need to pay my bills and figure out how to live, and that's life for this individual. Now, the thing where this parable becomes a, a little puzzling, the thing about Christ, why does he give us parables? Well, he, he wants us to wrestle, he wants us to think about the deeper issues, Right? Uh, he, he's a rabbi. He doesn't want to just give us the answers. We find in, in Luke 16, verse 9, Christ says, But I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. So we hear this, and we're hearing Christ teach his disciples as a response in the context here of of the Pharisees and tax, rebuking him because he's hanging out with sinners, tax collectors and sinners. And then Christ is basically saying in Luke 16, verse 9, hey, figure out how to, how to get along with the unrighteous because these unrighteous people, you know, they, they might take care of you. It's how it almost comes off. And so you, you read this and you say, well, what is Christ talking about? How, how can he commend a man who on the one hand does a horrible job for his manager, doesn't care about the well-being of his manager, only cares about himself, squanders his manager's wealth, and now Christ almost seems to be saying that this is good, that this is an honorable thing. And our catechism is teaching us that it's not an honorable thing, uh, that we're not to be dishonest, that, that we're not to be doing business dealings along these lines. So how do we answer this? Well, this is where we have to look at what we are called to do. So the Catechism wants us to know that we are called to do what is good for our neighbor. It's not looking for an opportunity to exploit. It's looking for an opportunity to honor, to help. Uh, this is where we talk about the golden rule. Uh, how I want someone to treat me is how I ought to treat someone else. Uh, put yourself in that person's shoes and, and how would you feel? And so that's what the, the catechism is inviting us to do. And also that we work faithfully so we can share. So this is along the lines of Ephesians uh, 4, verse 28, where uh, you know, the Apostle Paul exhorts the church of Ephesus to work 
uh, with one's hands so you can share with those who are in need. Uh, then it's that reminder of, of sharing and caring for one another. And so when, when we hear this, say, okay, so the positive is, as we, as we take from the catechism, the positive is basically, I am to be a productive member of society, right? I'm called to honor my God. And I'm called to understand that no matter what I do in terms of my work, I do it for his honor and glory. That's what I'm called to do. That's what I should desire to do. And so now when we go back to the story and we look at Luke 16, 9, say, okay, so, so the honorable thing is to care about my neighbor. The honorable thing is to understand that I'm a disciple of Christ. I'm called to, to live for him. But yet, Christ seems to commend this dishonorable, deceitful, wicked practice. And so is this what, what we're called to do? When we look at this in verse 9, we have to understand this, that Christ is commending something in particular about this man. So we back up to verse 8. And what does he commend? That the master commends this dishonest manager. So he's not saying that the manager did a great job. He's not saying, hey, you know what, what you did? This is honorable. This is great. Uh, we need to do more of this. Let, let's copy this practice. That's not at all what he's saying. He calls him a dishonest manager. But he compliments his shrewdness. And so the Christ is telling us that there's a shrewdness, that there is a wisdom that, that is to be emulated and, and is to be honored and, and respected here. Now, the man's not using his wisdom for the honor and glory of God. That, that's true. Uh, because what is he doing? He's trying to use his wealth to earn something so that he can get through tomorrow. Right? It's my works, my deeds, my wisdom, my shrewdness. And as I exercise these things, well, I don't need to rely on the living God. I just do these things in my wisdom. Now when we take verse 9 and we look at this again, that there's something else that Christ is saying that's subtle. That he tells us in terms of this age, uh, we are those who will be received into the eternal dwellings. So verse 9, on the one hand, on a superficial level, we might say, oh, well, see, Christ is saying this dishonest manager is a good guy. We, we should emulate and, and copy this practice. But that's not really what Christ is saying. What Christ is saying is that we need to look beyond our immediate here and now. And so Christ is calling to our attention. The problem is not how is this man going to have shelter? How is this man going to eat? What kind of job is he going to get? How is he going to support himself? Christ is saying there's a bigger issue that's pressing upon him. How does he stand eternally before the living God? This is a place and the, the real fundamental problem that, that we find here. And Christ goes on as he talks about this because he wants us to understand how we live. And as he calls us in how we live, he reminds us that we'll be faithful in little, we'll be faithful in much. As we're unfaithful in little, we'll be unfaithful in much. Um, he goes and tells us that, that there's this reality that as we do these things, there are people that will receive us into eternal dwellings. So we understand, okay, so there's the movement from the smaller picture to the greater picture. Uh, we know that what a person does in a smaller scenario, he will do in a larger scenario. That's what Christ is saying. But then verse 9 still becomes a little troubling because it sounds like Christ is telling us to still have a transactional view of, of mankind. In other words, as I take care of you or as I figure out a way to, to be shrewd with you or, or manipulate you, then you'll take care of me. So as I do X, then we're going to see that you respond with Y. So, so that's how it works. When we hear this, this is not really what Christ has said in, in the gospel. Because in, in Luke 6, verse 32 through 35, he's laid out that, that we give uh, with the expectation of not receiving in return. And so Luke 16, verse 9, seems a, a little strange in this, that here's this talk about doing these good things, and then people will receive you into eternal dwellings. And so as you do X, Y is going to happen. But yet Christ tells us that, that we have this assurance of, 
uh, this assurance that, that we just show love without the confidence we'll receive anything in return. Christ has also said, where do we lay up our, our treasures? In heaven. Luke 12, verse 33. Now Christ gives this in, in the context of uh, assuring us that there's no need to be anxious. God will take care of us. And we go on, we think about the parable of the banquet in Luke 14, uh, where Christ rebukes the Pharisees for inviting all the prestigious so they get invited back to their prestigious banquets. So you read Luke 16, verse 9, you say, but, but it sounds like you're contradicting Luke 14 especially, not to mention other things you've said. So, so what is Christ talking about here? Because this, this seems to be uh, something that, that certainly doesn't belong in the gospel, but yet we have no reason to say it shouldn't be in the gospel. So we have to take this word serious. So what do we do with it? Well, this is where verses 10 through 12 or 12, 10 through 12 are so important in the context here. <clears throat> because that movement from the lesser to the greater. Christ wants us to understand as we have a, a low priority in terms of the kingdom or our love for Christ, there's not going to be a great priority. And, and so the, the call is for us to understand how we function. If we're faithful with a little bit, we're going to be faithful with a lot. And so it's not a question of how do I get something in return? What does the, the, the shrewd manager fundamentally miss? He thinks there's only two options. Unite, um, basically, I can try and do manual labor or I can beg. Those are his only two options. But he doesn't do what the younger brother did, does he? The younger brother comes to his senses at some point, right? And he's down there trying to eat with pigs and he's thinking, what, what am I doing? My father's got all this wealth. I'll just go back to my dad. I'll repent and we'll see what my dad does with it. See, that's another option. The shrewd manager never exercised that option. That's what Christ is calling to our attention. He doesn't come to his master and say, yes, I have failed you. I have sinned. I have squandered your wealth. Be merciful. Please, even though I know I don't deserve it, what can I do to make this right? How can I regain trust? That's not going on. And so when Christ is commending this man and speaking of this lesser to the greater, He's saying, as this man has been completely unfaithful, he's going to be really unfaithful. As one is faithful with a little bit, one will be faithful with much. Why? Because one is oriented in the kingdom of God, understanding the reality of what we have. So now we take verse 9. We look again at those eternal dwellings. And what does this mean? Well, the shrewdness of what Christ is inviting us to do is as human beings is to understand our priority in the kingdom of God. As we walk by faith, as we walk in the confidence of Christ, Christ is inviting us to ask, what is the fundamental priority of our lives? And the priority of our lives is that we honor our Lord. That's what's going on here. So verse 9 is understanding that there's a bigger problem than just something temporal that lays before us. It's the eternal inheritance. Yes, we can find a shrewdness in survival. But what does a shrewdness fundamentally do for this man? Nothing that's lasting. Nothing that's ultimately enduring. And that's what Christ is saying. Have that picture to the bigger eternal inheritance that is set before you. In terms of our Christian life, you know, we talk about how we persevere by God's preserving power. Perseverance is our consciousness. Preservation is what God's doing. That's simply what Christ is getting at here, that we persevere by the Lord's uh, grace and mercy and his preserving power. Now, when we talk about this uh, parable, and we talked about verses 10 and 12, we, we put this in the context of verse 9, verse 13 really summarizes the ideal of this. Because verse 13 is telling us the reality of life. No servant can serve two masters. This is basically playing on what the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans 6, 
or Romans, I guess Paul's playing on this in Romans 6, and understanding we're slaves of righteousness, no longer slaves of sin. And that's really what, what's going on here, having that desire, that greedy desire, that covetous desire uh, to, to be in the place of God, to have more, uh, to survive through one's wisdom and through one's means without relying on the Lord at all or having any consciousness of God. And so Christ is saying the reality is no one can serve two masters. You're either going to be driven uh, by the wealth of this age or you're going to be driven by Christ. Uh, you, you can't say, well, I have Christ and I have wealth and these two things are going to secure me. I have Christ, I have my wisdom. I have Christ, I have my greed. I have Christ and whatever else is put in the place of, of resting in God. But it's also important to understand in terms of this. That you can have a very poor person who's incredibly covetous. You can have a very rich person who's very content. You have a very rich person who's incredibly covetous. You have a very poor person who is also very content. And so it's not necessarily one's lot in life that determines whether they're keeping this commandment. The reality is, this is Christ inviting us to look within ourselves, ask ourselves what's driving us as we live out of gratitude, and ask ourselves, you know, what is our real master? Are we seeking to live unto the Lord? Are we resting in self? Or are we uh, those who are giving ourselves over to desiring more and more and having this greediness? Or are we truly waiting upon the Lord, trusting in his provision, and knowing that God will provide? God will see us through each day of our lives. And so the point of theft then is that when we look at what the catechism is reminding us, we look at the shrewdness of this manager. Obviously, I believe this belongs in the Word of God. I believe Christ gave this parable. I don't believe that there's any reason at all uh, to say that this is not something that Christ has said. It's again, it's a parable. It's a call for us to, to dig into the deeper meaning. That's why the Lord gives us parables. It's a means of opening our eyes to seeing the kingdom and the power of the Spirit or closing our eyes to seeing the kingdom and the power of the Spirit. That's the reality of what a parable is. And so when, when we hear this, the point of this parable is really a question. You know, what, what drives us? This is what verse 13 is getting at. What, what fundamentally drives us? Is it just a desire to have more for the sake of more? Or are we those who are truly living in the power of Christ, living by his provision? The dishonest manager, what does he do? Well, he's using his shrewdness to figure out how to advance himself in this age. And at the end of the day, he's really not getting himself out of a, a serious predicament at all. And what Christ is inviting us to do is to ask ourselves, how do we use our shrewdness for his honor and glory? How do we live out the gospel? Basically, how do we do this as we sojourn under the sun out of gratitude? And that's the important point. This is where the law of God isn't put in a place where we're doing this to earn uh, the merits and, and the grace of God. But we're doing this because we've been made alive in Christ. And so as Christ is speaking to us, he's saying, here's the reality of who we are as people. We can be self-reliant. We can say, I can do this by my hands. Look at what my hands have done. You know, we say, I'm pulling myself up by my own bootstraps, right? We, we can say these things. But the catechism in our Lord is saying, do you see how the providence of God, by his grace and his mercy, is the one who has led, the one who has cared, the one who has provided? Wait upon your Lord. He will provide and he is faithful. He is a gracious God who gives us more uh, than we deserve and certainly will give us everything we need to live out every day of our life, no matter what those circumstances may be. And ultimately, our eternal inheritance is secured because of Christ. And so in conclusion then, what is the positive side of the kingdom? Well, the positive side is that we discern basically how to use uh, what God has given us for his honor and glory. How do we do this? What does that look like? And that's what this parable is inviting us to do. It's not necessarily uh, saying that we have to be paupers or that we necessarily have to live 
um, and continual suffering. But the reality is, Christ is saying, you know, give some thought. How do we manage our, our wealth? How do we manage our resources? How are we being stewards of God's good gifts? How are we living in the confidence of Christ? But the ultimate assurance of this that Christ is giving us is that he is our God. He is our Lord. He is our Redeemer. He is the one who provides. And so it's a reminder and a call for us once again to rest in him. And to understand that our priority is to live as servants of the Most High. That's where Christ ends in this parable, that we serve the living God. Why? Because we have been redeemed in Christ. So as Paul says, we are no longer slaves of sin, we're slaves of righteousness. It's not to be tyrannical. See, Apostle Paul reminding us, we have been moved to life because of what Christ Jesus has done. This is where we pray for wisdom, pray for shrewdness, and a wisdom that's oriented in the power of heaven by the Holy Spirit. And so the real positive note then is that we remember we are redeemed in Christ, made alive in Christ. We are those who are called to serve Christ, to be aware, conscious, understanding, that we can be tempted to serve other things in this age other than our God. What Christ is simply doing is reminding us and exhorting us to have a clear focus on who we are, the redeemed saints of the Lord Most High, who is our shield and defender, securing our eternal inheritance. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, Reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.